Uh, hello everyone, my name is Alan Woodward. Uh, I'm from Flax, which is an open source consultancy based in the UK, and I'm going to talk to you about how you query a Lucid Index, what actually happens when you run a query. Um, let's just start off with, we have the slide that the marketing manager makes me put up at all these talks. Um, so yes, this is who Flax is, we're an uh, open source consultancy based in Cambridge. Um, we've been around for a while, we do lots of interesting stuff. Um, hit me up if you want any more details on that. So the talk today, what I'm going to basically do is take you through um, some of the, the Java classes um, that, uh, that, are required, that you use when you run a query in Lucene. Um, we'll talk about how things match, we'll talk about how you collect all those matching documents, uh, we'll go through the, sort of the details of how a few um, of the simpler queries work, and I'll talk about query caching as well. Um, this is sort of an entry-level talk. Uh, Adrian here is doing another talk at half past four, which is um, sort of more detailed on how particular types of slow queries work. Um, so that's a, a sort of a, a nice follow-up to this one. Um, but the most important thing is, why should I care? Why, who cares uh, how these things work? Um, this talk, uh, the idea initially came from uh, a workshop I did at Glasgow Strathclyde University last year. Uh, called Lucene for IR, um, which was introducing uh, the Lucene open source Java library to um, students, academics, uh, working on information retrieval, who tend to not use um, sort of commercial software in their own research. They use things like Terrier, um, which is, you know, lots of papers are published on this, um, but then no one outside academia actually uses it. Um, and all, all their research and um, the, the things they were doing uh, based on Lucene were making certain assumptions about how queries work, how documents are collected, how things are scored, which don't actually apply to Lucene. So, okay, well, if you're, if you're writing your own query, if you're writing your own similarity, if you're doing any kind of this, this sort of level of, uh, of research or uh, implementation, then it helps to know what the framework does, how it all fits together. Um, plus, the main reason why you should care is because it's interesting. You know, we're all geeks here. That's why we're here. Um, so, here are some of the classes I'm going to talk about. There's lots of them. They have scary names. Um, some of them have names which are there because that's what they were called when Lucene 1 was released 15 years ago, and their purpose has changed entirely, but they still have the same name. But there we go. Um, we start off with, we have an index reader. So... Your Lucene index is a bunch of files on disk, um, and the, the way that's stored is pluggable, you have different codecs, um, but the, the, so the implementation of, of how all these data structures are stored is completely hidden from the client, generally speaking, um, and you get access to everything through the index reader class. Um, so this gives you access to uh, the inverted index, to, um, to doc values, so per document, um, to look more like a database table, to the KD tree, which is new in Lucene 6, um, which is a better way of storing dimensional data, numeric data, um, term vectors, uh, general corpus statistics, things like uh, number of documents that have a particular term, or the number, total number of terms, total number of tokens, um, all the things that you need when you're executing a query and when you're scoring a query. So the index reader gives you access to all these things, and then the index searcher wraps your index reader, and that exposes a bunch of methods, um, helper methods to actually run your queries. So this is the important thing when you're doing a search, the first thing you need is a searcher. And then the next thing you need is a query. Uh, so we have a query object, uh, which is an abstract class, uh, and this defines what you actually want to get from your index. So if, if it's a term query, you're, you're getting a, um, you know, a single, you're searching for a, a single term. If it's a Boolean, you're searching for this or that, this and that. If it's a phrase query, you want to get things with uh, the, the terms that are next to each other. All these different types of queries are, are, have their own class. Um, they're independent of your index reader. You can run the same query against lots of different index readers, or lots of different indexes, uh, and you're, obviously you're going to get different documents back because the, the documents in all these different indexes are going to be different, but the, um, the kind of fundamental uh, abstract notion of what it is that you're going to retrieve uh, is independent of the actual thing you're searching over. Um, they're immutable. 
this is an important thing. If you're using uh, query caches, uh, you need to make sure your query is immutable. Uh, if you can go and change it under the hood, then suddenly you're going to start getting wrong results back from a cache. Uh, yeah, so this is important. If you're writing your own queries ever, then bear in mind you need, you need to make it, make sure it's immutable, otherwise you're going to start getting weird results back from, uh, from your index searcher. Now, the, the, the important thing here is that the query is independent of the index reader. So under the hood, when you actually run the query, Lucy needs to turn that query object into something that is relevant to that particular index. Uh, and what we have here is it's called a weight. Um, normally this is all hidden. So when you're externally, when you're running a query, you just run the query against the index and you get your top box back or something like that. You don't see the weight. Um, but this is used internally and it's the specific representation of this query for this index reader. Um, yeah, and it, uh, it maintains state for your query that relates to everything in the index. So not specific bits of the index, it's kind of a global view over your index. Um, you create it by calling query.createWait. Um, not all queries can do this. Uh, there's, it's a slight, I don't know, it's kind of a, a bit of a rough edge in the, in the Lucene API that you can have a query that can't actually create a weight. The, 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 I think there ought to be sort of be two different classes there, but that's a, another discussion. Um, there's a, so certain types of queries, you need to rewrite them against a particular index reader first. Uh, so a, a Thomson query is the one. I'll give an example here, like a wildcard or a regular expression. What that will do is you give it an index reader and it rewrites itself into a disjunction query. Um, so we had the weight, and the weight looks at the global view of the index. Um, Next, I need to talk to a bit about the, the structure of the, of the Lucene index, so uh, before I can sort of go and explain what happens next. Um, so your Lucene index structure, uh, it's not one big monolithic thing. Um, it actually consists of lots of different segments of index. Each segment itself is a kind of a, an index in itself. Um, they're built in memory. Um, when you add documents to your index writer, it'll batch everything up, um, buffer everything, it builds your segment, and then it flushes it out to disk when you call commit. Um, and then uh, also when you, when you call commit, when something's flushed to disk, you have another background process which will merge segments together. So you don't end up with lots and lots of tiny segments. Then some of them will get merged together into larger segments behind the scenes. Um, why do we do this? Uh, the main reason is to, it means that you can do incremental indexing really easily. So when you're adding new documents, you don't have to go and change already existing index structures. You can just add another index structure, another index sort of onto the end of your existing index, um, and you don't have to update anything. So that's good for speed of indexing, uh, and it's also good for, uh, for immutability, uh, for um, data integrity. Uh, you can make sure that, you know, once you can write a checksum, and you know that when you've got that set of bytes, that particular index segment, once it's written once, you can read it in, you've got to check your checksum, and you can be sure that the, the data is correct. So the index reader um, gives you a view over all these individual segments. Uh, we have a leaves method. Leaves returns a bunch of leaf reader contexts. Um, the leaf reader context is a view over an individual segment, uh, but it also it, it has um, uh, an ID, which um, the, sorry, it has a, uh, an ordinal, which means they're ordered within the segment, uh, and it also uh, records a, a doc base, so you can map your ID from that segment into sort of a global space of uh, IDs over the whole index. Uh, and it also, uh, the leaf reader context also exposes a, a leaf reader, uh, which is like an index reader, uh, but it's for an individual segment. So what does this all mean for searching? Well, your index reader gives you the top level view. That's the view over the whole index. Um, you can get some access to some data structures that way, but it's kind of an inefficient way of doing it because it's going to have to merge the data structures from all the individual segments together. Um, so generally the way we search things is we actually, you iterate over all the segments. You do a search over one segment, search over the next segment, a segment, search over the next one, and then combine those results. Um, weight 
again, it gives you that view over the whole thing. So if you want to actually do your search, uh, you can't use a weight because a weight is, is too, too granular. We need a different object. And that object is called a scorer. So the scorer maintains your state for the query um, for each individual leaf reader. So you have the, the query at the top level, which is index reader independent. Then you have weight, which is the, uh, the, the representation of that query for this index reader, for the, so the top level. And then you have a scorer, which is the representation of that query for each individual segment. Um, it provides an iterator over documents. So when you say, OK, I've got my segment, I've got my scorer over the segment, I can just call this iterator, and it will return all the documents that match in turn. Um, it also gives you access to the scoring mechanism, hence why it's called the scorer. Um, so you get a doc, uh, so doc ID set iterator is returned. Uh, you advance over your, your iterator, and then you can call scorer.score for each document that you're sitting on, and it will give you, you know, the, the score for that document. Um, yeah, generated by weight.scorer, and um, there is a, sort of a shortcut here. If you know that this particular scorer isn't going to match anything in this particular segment, it'll just return null, uh, and you can sort of shortcut. Um, as I said, yeah, scorer is a, it's a bit of a legacy name, um, because scoring isn't necessarily the scorer's primary purpose. Uh, you can still use it to iterate over documents even when you're not actually interested in the score if you're using it as a filter, for example. So let's tie it all together. We've got your query objects, uh, independent of everything, just a representation of what you want to, uh, what you want to retrieve from a particular index. Given your index reader, you have a query generate, then generates a weight. To match your documents, the weight generates a scorer for each segment, and uh, that scorer then gives you a doc ID set iterator, which will iterate over all the matching documents in that segment. Let's give you it's a bit of pseudocode here. Uh, so you, you create your weight, um, you iterate over all the, the leaves uh, within your index, you create your scorer for each leaf, you get your iterator uh, for that scorer, and then you iterate over the iterator. Um, so the important thing is, what do we do with that doc ID once we have it? So the next class we need to look at is the collector. Uh, and this says, OK, I've got a list of all my matching documents. What do I want to do with those documents as they come in? Uh, again, the collector um, has the same dual structure. It has a, the, the top level collector, which is for the, uh, for the whole search, and then a leaf collector, which is the representation of that collector for each segment. Um, and when you go through uh, in our um, the pseudocode I had earlier, um, you know, as, as you get each document, you then call collector.collect uh, with, that, with the, uh, the document ID that's matching. So we can give you that pseudocode again, and you can say here, in the middle here, we're calling collect with the document ID. Um, this is obviously heavily simplified. Uh, there's a number of other things that Lucene allows you to do. You can search leaves in parallel if you pass an executor in. Um, some scorers will actually score a whole bunch of documents at the same time using something called a bulk scorer, which is uh, good for performance in certain circumstances. Um, this, I'm not talking about deleted documents here, which add another complication. You need, to, um, if you need to be able to skip over documents that you know have actually been deleted in the index. Um, and you can also have something called early termination. So if you have, for example, a sorted, uh, a sorted index, and, and you can, if, you're, uh, if you're trying to collect things in a sorted order, and you know that once you've got to a certain doc ID, because the index itself is sorted, you can stop iterating over everything, and you can jump out. But, but that's basically the, uh, the, sort of the nucleus of what happens when you search in Lucy. So Lucene has a bunch of collectors that come with it. Um, the, when you, your normal search, when you search for a query and say, OK, well, I want to get the top 10 highest scoring results from this query, uh, Lucene uses something called a top score dot collector. Uh, when you're sorting by field, it uses the top field collector. Um, you can create your own collector and pass that in. That's a, a public method on searcher. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so all these top end collector classes use a priority queue, uh, which means that obviously if you're doing deep paging, 
uh, if you want to say, okay, I want to get the 1,700th result to the 1,710th result, if it's you're using a priority queue, what it has to do is it then allocates you know, space for all those top 1,700 results and then throws away um, the, the, the most of them. Um, so what, index, uh, what Lucene allows you to do is actually it exposes this method called search after, uh, which allows Lucene to, uh, to, to, to determine whether you're going to put something in the priority queue based on both the top and the bottom values. Um, so this is when, if you look at Solar or Elasticsearch, um, if you, you know, just page through uh, to doing next, 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 next in, in one of these search applications, you'll, you tend to run out of memory and things die. Uh, but if you use a scroll query or a cursor mark, uh, under the scenes, that's using the search after method. Uh, so that's much more memory efficient. So in terms of how you could score things and what information you have to hand when you're doing this scoring, collection and scoring are done as you iterate through things. So they're done a document at a time. Um, so your scoring al algorithm doesn't actually know anything about how many documents you've matched, uh, what documents have matched before or after. Um, and this is actually information that is, can be quite useful um, for uh, general scoring algorithms. Um, so Lucene actually provides a, another class called the Rescorer. Um, and this allows you to do a, a first pass search, which again, you collect all your documents, you, you can score those with your sort of standard um, uh, your, your standard scoring mechanism, your BM25, whatever it is, um, you collect those top thousand documents or whatever, and then you use a rescorer to uh, to go and uh, do more complicated scoring uh, on those those collected results. Um, so something like learning to rank, which Diego, and I'm sure if he's here, was talking about earlier, um, will use this method. Um, it uh, you, know, you collect everything first, and then you run your, you know, run your scorer again. So what we're going to do now is we'll look at a couple of queries to see how the, the score iteration actually works, how things are implemented. Um, the simplest one is term query. Uh, so this just takes the postings enumeration um, from your leaf reader, so which is just an iterator over the postings list of a particular term. Um, so you have where we have our doc ID set iterator, which basically just delegates directly to the uh, the postings enumeration, which will iterate over your postings list. Um, if the postings enumeration is null, uh, that means there's no matching terms for this particular token in that segment. So the whole thing returns null. Very simple, very straightforward, very fast. It doesn't need to do anything clever. It's just literally reading bytes off disk. Uh, Boolean query is, is um, the more complicated one. This is kind of the uh, the, the most I don't know, your the, the heavy duty, uh, the, the work, hard worker of, uh, of the Lucene query family. Um, and so you can have in Boolean queries, you can have must clauses, you can have should clauses, you can have must not clauses, you can have filter clauses, and different combinations of all these things will actually result in different scorers being used under the hood. Um, so if you only have must clauses, it's a pure conjunction, then we use a uh, conjunction scorer. Uh, if you only have should clauses, it's a pure disjunction, then we use a disjunction sum scorer. We have rec opt scorer, so required and optional uh, for combinations of those. Uh, and then if you've got must not clauses on there as well, you have the rec excl, so required and excluded scorer. Um, these all work in different ways. Uh, Conjunction scorer is, uh, is probably the simplest one in that it just, um, scorers can uh, expose something called a cost, which is kind of a guess of how complicated it's going to be to run this, uh, to iterate over this particular scorer. So conjunction scorer sorts by, by the cost and says, okay, whatever the, whatever the lowest cost uh, score is, I can use that to drive my iteration. Um, it calls next doc on that, uh, and then it will advance everything else to, to the same one, to the same doc ID. Um, uh, if, if we have a match there, then excellent. Everything's on the same document. We can match, we return that ID. Uh, if it's not, then uh, we find out what the maximum ID of all the scores is, and then advance the lead document to that one again. So we're using the, um, the lowest cost score to drive the iteration, uh, which means you can, you know, you can skip over um, more complicated scores. Uh, 
the disjunction query uses a priority queue, um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a heap implementation, I think. Um, scores will advance to the first matching document. Um, whatever the lowest, uh, yeah, the score of the lowest doc ID, um, you start off with that. You use that to drive the iteration. Um, you, uh, you call next doc on the whatever it is that's got the lowest doc ID. Uh, you update, update the heap. And the current doc ID is the doc ID at the bottom of, that, of the queue. Um, I'm simplifying here, obviously. Um, but that's generally, generally speaking, what the algorithm is. Uh, required optional scorer combines conjunction and disjunction. Um, the important, uh, a nice uh, thing to point out here is if, if we don't care about scores, if we only care about matches, then we can just ignore the disjunction part entirely. Uh, because it's the conjunction part which is driving whether something matches or not. Disjunction just adds to the score. Um, if scores are required, then it advances using the conjunction uh, and then advances the disjunction uh, up to that same point, um, that's that, that same doc ID, uh, to, to get the scores. Uh, and then the uh, required exclusion scorer um, can take, yeah, so it takes any of the other three scores to drive the iteration. Uh, and then we have our exclusion scorer as well, and it just advances the child scorer and checks against the other one, against the exclusion scorer, uh, to determine whether something should match or not. Um, phrase query, so this is if you're, you want to find out, uh, it's basically a conjunction, it's I want this, this document to con contain both these terms, but I also want them to be next to each other. Um, so, uh, and there are two different types of scorer. There's an exact phrase, which is okay. I, these two need to be a fixed, uh, a fixed number of positions apart, or the sloppy phrase scorer, which is a terrifying ball of wax. Um, that kind of works, we think. Um, there are some tests which have been ignored for about ten years because no one can work out whether they're supposed to work or not. Um, and yeah, so again, it's, it's a specialized conjunction. We, we, um, uh, you check to see the document's got all the terms in it, and once you find a document which has all the terms in it, you then go and check the positions. Uh, there are, so there are ways of speeding this up uh, using something called two-phase iteration, which Andrew's gonna talk about later on this afternoon, so everyone come to, come to his talk. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about query caching. So we have all these um, these different scorers, and what essentially they produce at the end is they produce bit sets. Um, it's an it's a iterator over a bit set per segment, um, which if you've got a very complex query, it's quite useful to be able to cache that. Now, if you want scores as well, then the, the problem with, the, with trying to cache that is that it's not very compressible. Scores come out as floats. If you end up matching something you know, uh, over a very large set of your um, set of the a very large proportion of the index, you're going to end up sort of trying to store lots and lots and lots of float values which don't compress at all. Uh, and also, it's specific for that index, so that you can't share it um, uh, between different index readers. Um, so, but if we all, we, we have stuff that. Doesn't, isn't scoring, it's just being used to filter stuff out, then that's nicely cacheable. Um, and Index Searcher has a query cache that will, will handle all this for you. Um, yeah, so rather than calling query.createWait directly, we go through the Index Searcher instead, called Index uh, and then the Index Searcher will say, okay, if I don't need any scores on this, um, we'll wrap it, 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 it wraps that weight with, uh, with what's something called caching wrapper weight, um, which can then uh, determine whether or not it's going it, to, well, it can determine whether or not you've already run that query, uh, and if you have, then it can retrieve results from its cache. Um, if you haven't, it can run it in the background and, and cache that result. Um, yeah, so when, you, when we call scorer, caching wrapper weight goes, and see, goes to see if it's actually already got the, uh, the, the bit set somewhere. Um, and the important thing is because cache wrapper is at the segment level, um, it's not a view over the whole index, it's a view over each individual segment. So if you're doing incremental indexing, um, you have a bunch of data that's come in, you open your searcher, you open a new index reader, and you open a new searcher, you might find that actually quite a lot of the data in there is exactly the same as it was in your previous searcher. If you've just added a new segment on the end, 
end, you've still got a lot of the same data structures there. And you can share your query cache between these two index searches. Um, and because it's got a view over the same segments, um, it can reuse all that. You don't have to regenerate all your caches. You don't invalidate everything just by opening up a new segment. Um, this is a very useful thing. How can we tell that scoring is not required? Um, well, there's two ways. Uh, a particular collector might not be interested in scores. Um, so, for example, a uh, collector that sorts things by, by field values, it doesn't really care about the scores. Um, it can, uh, so it, it, it's, it's um, available for caching. Uh, and also, when, you're, when you um, pass things as, uh, as filters to Boolean query, that's actually should be Boolean query dot occur dot filter, that ought to be. Um, you can say, okay, these particular um, elements of the Boolean query, um, I don't care about the scores on these, I'm just using them to filter stuff out, uh, in which case we can use that they're available for caching. Uh, yeah, right, I've kind of burnt through these. Does anyone have any questions? Stunned into uh, silence. We still have a few minutes, so if you have any question right now, uh, so there is time for that. If not, there is a long break to, <laughs> if you're too intimidated to do it in public. Okay. <coughs> um, so the way I guess you've explained it, Everything seems to have kind of a, an overall version and then a leaf version. Yes. Um, I guess the way you've explained it, scorer is effectively a leaf weight. Has anyone ever kind of considered renaming it, or is that just too scary to even <laughs> think about? Uh, I think it's one of those things that someone could come up with a new name for it, and then everyone else would hate it. So it, it's, you know, you know, we, we, we covered naming things and cache invalidation here. So yeah, this is obviously, it's all the hard problems. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, that, that would be a good description of it, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Bit of a vague one, but if you wanted to trace through a live Lucene query, is there any way to see all of this happening? Uh, well, obviously, you can step through using a debugger. Um, there aren't hooks for that kind of thing generally because this is, you know, this is the hot loop in the middle of the seat. This is the, the very, very fast stuff. So there aren't really any ways of uh, exposing that automatically. Um, one thing you could do, I suppose, would be you could, pass, you could implement your own collector, uh, which you know, could emit stack traces or whatever whenever it hits a particular document. Um, and, uh, and you can do wrapping collectors, so you could have a collector that you know, delegates to your top scorer or uh, top score or top field collector or whatever, or what have you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I learned most of this just by stepping through with the debugger. So, uh, you quickly talked about the rescore uh, mm -hmm. functionality when. The initial pass happens. Where do the documents, the matching documents, reside then to be rescored? Okay. Yes. So I didn't, I didn't cover top docs. So when you, uh, when you use, uh, was it a top score collector? Um, obviously, well, the collector just sits there and it just, just pulls these documents in. Um, and then each collector implementation will then have another method on it, it says which you call at the end to say, okay, I now have some results back. These, these are the results I've got. These are the top ones I'm going to give you. Um, so Rescorer takes a top docs implementation, um, and that just—I mean—that's literally just an array of um, ints. Uh, basically, it's just a wrapper of an array of ints, yeah, which is the doc IDs. Um, it doesn't store anything else. Uh, so if you're then, you know, if you're in Solar or Elasticsearch, if you're then trying to return on lots of field values, uh, what what they have to do is then go through for each of those doc IDs and go and retrieve them separately from stored fields, which is a bit slower, which is why you only ever do that for like the top 10. You don't do it in the collector as everything's happening there. Uh, but yeah, so for a rescorer, the, um, you would you do your search, you get your top docs uh, instance back, and then you pass that to, to rescorer. It will use those doc IDs. You mentioned earlier that segments could decide not to score, in a sense, uh -huh. early terminate. Can you talk what support there is for early termination? 
Uh, <laughs> if any. I'll have to remember what it is now. Um, so, I mean, the way it basically works is it throws an exception. It's early, early termination exception. Um, there are a number of different ways you can do that. Uh, the, um, so the, the, the two that I can think of off the top of my head are timed ones. You can say, well, I want to put a time limit on this query. Um, if it's going to take longer than 10 milliseconds, I just want you to bail out. Um, and so you can put that on, a, on each segment as it starts off and say, OK, I've got a, a new scorer here. Um, have I run out of time? Um, but you can also do it as part of the uh, part of the iteration within the scorer itself. You can say, OK, um, when you call uh, you know, next doc or whatever, actually, well, OK, we've run out of time now. I'm going to throw an early terminating exception. Um, and then the other way of doing that is if you've got a sorted index. So say you're interested in returning things by date. You can say, well, I'm going to sort everything in this index so that the, uh, the latest things come at the beginning of the index and you go sort of going back in time as you iterate through. And if you're only interested in stuff that's happened since yesterday, as you get through, as you're iterating through, you can see, okay, well, I've got to, this document here has a field value that's sort of beyond the, the, where I'm interested in, so I know that everything else I hit in this iteration is not going to be irrelevant for me. So you can just bail out then and throw your early termination exception. And that's all handled at the top level uh, in uh, index search dot, dot search after. Uh, I had a question. So when you call a create score on the wait, clearly you're going to make multiple scores in a single uh, index because an index has multiple segments. Yeah. Uh, practically speaking, when would you create multiple weights from a single query? Um, at the, for the top level, like obviously a Boolean query will call create weight underneath the hood for mm -hmm. all the sub queries, but when would the Boolean queries create weight be called multiple times? I used uh, so multiple times for different queries or multiple times within the same query? Within the same query. Um, now, generally speaking, it's only be called once. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's never an instance where it's not called, where it's called more than once? Because I, I, I also know that it, from my experience, it's only usually called once, but I don't know if there's... Yeah, I think it's only called know. once. It can be quite a heavy operation as well. It, um, it will be due... Uh, for certainly for things like term queries, it goes and it, uh, when you create the weight, it also goes and reads lots of information from the index about you know, where in each segment it needs to jump to to get to read the terms index. Um, and it does all that up front. Um, and yeah, and that can be quite a uh, sort of IO intensive operation. That can be quite a slow operation. So you want to make sure that, you know, that that's um, not happening more than once. Anyone? Uh, Ishan, do you have a point? Yeah. Wait, what? 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 I wanted to understand which parts of uh, the query uh, are most expensive, and um, so actually you alluded to it, and probably Adrian is going to talk about it. Right, yes. Um, so generally speaking, uh, any query that involves positions is going to be slower because it's not just you're not just iterating through a postings list, you're also having to then go and check positions. Uh, and it's not one operation per document that you hit, it's actually several operations. Um, there are, so there's various payload queries which are a similar thing. Um, it's reading through positions and then reading uh, payload bytes out per position and, and doing uh, comparisons on those. Um, so that's why, yeah, that's, what, and that's why you have this cost exposed. Um, so if you've got a, a conjunction query that has one you know, very simple term query and one quite complicated span query or something like that, um, then you want to drive it with that term query uh, and make sure that you know, you're not having to do all these complicated operations on, on, this, more, on this heavier scorer that actually we know we're not going to hit that document anyway because it's a conjunction and the term query doesn't match. Um, I think we're good. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you.